Hey, this week we are doing professional codes of ethics. Please follow along with the slides. So the readings for the week are two. One, chapter four in Tavani. I posted the PDF to the book. Just read chapter four. Don't read the whole book. You can read the whole book if you want to, but it's not that great and it's old. But do read chapter four. Particularly pay attention to the justifications for codes of ethics and the section on whistleblowing and to George's criteria. We're going to go over those in the slides right now. Also posted critical, critical, critical reading. If you don't read the Devani, read this. The ACM, Association of Computer Machinery Code of Ethics booklet. That's what you're going to be tested on. You're going to have it open for the exam, but the more familiar with it you are, the better you're going to do. What that does is the ACM just passed a new code of ethics last year, and it runs through it in detail, explaining each point. That's the best resource you can possibly have for the exam and for working in the profession, for those of you who do. Okay, let's get started on the videos. So, why do we have a code of ethics? That's a really good question. It's a particularly good question in the computer field. So, uh, purposes of a professional code are inspiration, to give people a sense that the profession is ethical, that there's a standard for you all to meet and to live up to. Education, what is digital ethics? How does it work? What should you do? Guidance, hey, I got a problem. Well, how should I solve this problem? What should I do here? Let me look at the code and see what it can tell me. Accountability, a standard to hold people to. You're expected to be able to meet the ethical standard in the code of ethics if you're a professional. Enforcement, if you break it, ideally it can be held against you. What you're going to see is ACM, not enforceable. And the last one, the one that is particularly interesting and important to me, is preempting government regulation. Professions have codes of ethics so the law doesn't have to. And it's something that has been very effective for professions throughout time, where if there's a problem with ethics in the profession, there's a tendency to pass some laws regulating the profession. Professions don't like being regulated. They don't like other people telling them what to do. They'd rather do it themselves. So if they can show the legislature, whether it's the state or Congress, that they've got a good enforceable code in place, Congress will often leave them alone. The key example of this is scuba diving. Dangerous sport, right? When it came out, people were dying because anybody could just say, hey, I'm a scuba instructor, come diving with me. And that wasn't so good. So there's a lot of pressure to regulate the sport by law. And what happened was uh, dive shop owners and producers in the industry got together and said, hey, we're going to do this ourselves. And they came up with a very strict scheme of professional regulation. And it worked. And, it's, and diving is one of the safest sports there is out there because the industry code is so incredibly strictly enforced on people in the industry. So that's a good case. Uh, the ACM is the bad case. It's the other end of the spectrum. You don't have to be a member of the professional association to be in the computing field. It's optional. If you're a doctor, you've got to be in the American Medical Association. If you're a lawyer, you've got to be in the American Bar Association. No way around it. Computers, nah, you don't have to be. So obviously, if you're not a member, they can't enforce it against you. Also, there's no enforcement. It's just guidelines. So, eh, no penalties if you break it. That's a problem. Some of the other criticisms of codes of ethics are it tends to treat ethics as check the boxes. Did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? Okay, I met the, the minimum. I haven't broken anything. Fine, I'm good. And it avoids thinking about the process, which is, of course, what we're entirely about in this class. It also doesn't help much when principles come into conflict, and they do, because there will be situations, like on the exam, where one part of the code says do one thing and the other part of the code says do the other, and hey, what do you do? So code's not very helpful for that. So the new ACM code is up. It's, in, it's on the website that's listed. It's in the booklet. And as the slide says, it's not an algorithm for solving problems. You don't shove a problem in one end, crank the handle, and get an answer at the other. It's a way of thinking about ethics. So it's an addition or another means to the ethical theories we've looked at so far. Um, I've thrown a couple other codes at you just for comparison, so you can see the difference between something that is strictly enforceable, like the American Bar Association code, and the weak sauce that the ACA code is. Okay, that's it for codes. Whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is when you are in a company, in the government, and you see something illegal or hinky going on, and you call attention to it. Now, you can either call attention to it by 
telling your supervisor or going over your supervisor's head or going public on your blog, on a website, or by going to the press. So, uh, there are ethical standards for when it's a, appropriate to be a whistleblower and how to do it. I've thrown the biggest case in the past in a decade or so at you, the Snowden case, where it, a contractor for the National Security Agency was looking over documents and saw that there was stuff going that the government was doing that he thought was terrible and illegal around the war in Iraq. So he made copies of those documents and took them to the press. It's a big deal. There's a time, I give you a timeline, an overview news article, and there's a couple good movies about Snowden if you want to see those. So in Tavani, he talks about George's concepts for evaluating whistleblower. And I'm going to test you on those. So uh, his criteria for effective whistleblowing are, did you run through the process in your firm or in the government that you were supposed to first? Because if you can tell your boss and your boss can stop it, don't go to Fox News. Just deal with your boss. If your boss is the problem, did you go to their supervisor or to the CEO or to the appropriate channels up the company before going public? That's one, internal versus external. Two, personal versus impersonal. Are you doing this for fame and fortune? Are you doing this because your reputation's at stake? Or are you doing this because you really see something wrong that needs to be addressed? And third, governmental versus non-governmental laws are different if it's a corporation versus it's a government. In Snowden's case, where he was dealing with classified information that was against the law to disclose. Okay, uh, slide with DeGeorge's criteria for evaluation. Look over those, be familiar with those, be ready to apply those on an exam. Uh, you can also evaluate whistleblowing by the ethical standards that we've talked about, utilitarianism, deontology, and virtue ethics. Probably going to ask you to do those. Um, key thing here is how to apply the codes to the exam. Basically, when I give you a fact pattern, run through every person that you're asked about, or every issue, and check them off against each single item in the Code of Ethics. Did Joe violate, violate Section 1? Yes. Section 2? No. Section 3? No. Section 4? Yes. Section 5? Yes. Okay, did Mary violate section one? No, section uh, like that. All right. Um, I've given you two practices. I've given you last year's exam, and I've given you a news article on the Volkswagen scandal from a couple of years ago. If you want to practice, run through those, um, identify all the stakeholders, identify everything they did, and evaluate their actions either by the code of ethics and or by one of the ethical theories. If you want to submit stuff to me before the exam, uh, email me an answer and I'll go over it with you. This has been a long video. Thank you for bearing with me. If you got questions, please ask them on Canvas. Don't email me questions because everybody's got questions, so better everybody sees your answers. And good luck with this one.